Well, the Providence Friars are one of the hottest teams in all of college basketball, and after a stellar season last year, it begs the question, is Ed Cooley one of the best coaches in all of college basketball? You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up? Welcome to the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, Andy Patton, and I may be battling a cold, but who, you know who is not cold? The Providence Friars. You know what? We got to practice our our segues into those here. Matt St. Jane is here of Road to the Garden. Uh, Matt, I want to talk to you about this Providence team. They are one of the hottest teams in college basketball Nine straight wins in a row, six and zero in Big East Conference play, fourteen and three on the year. Uh, I know this team got some flack last year for being a little bit lucky in some of the games that they played, but man, they look legit, legit so far this year. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this team. Yeah, Andy, thanks for having me on. I love your segue into that. <laughs> hey, by the way, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think uh, the first thing that jumps out to me about this Providence team is winning six games in a row in the Big East is not something Ooh. that is new for this team. Um, it just doesn't usually happen at this point in the season. 2016-17, uh, they won their last six Big East games to kind of secure a bid uh, in March Madness. They did it at the end of the 2019-2020 season, which would have gotten them in had there been a tournament. And then they had some, some long winning streaks last year. But doing it right in a row at the start of conference play is something this program has has never seen before. I believe 4-0 and was new to them. They never won the first four games. So six yeah. games is brand new territory. And it all, I mean, it's all capped by that big win over UConn. Yeah. Um, that's that's the shining gem on this. Beating DePaul, beating Butler. Those are the ones you kind of expect to happen. Beating St. John's at home, which they did this past Saturday, you expect mm-hmm. those. Beating UConn at home is the cherry on top. And yeah. that's why the Friars are ranked now at number 19. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's been a fantastic season. I mean, they dropped 100 points on Marquette. That's fantastic to see them do that 20-point victory over Butler. Butler has not been particularly good, but that's still a nice win on the road. Uh, this team has been absolutely fantastic, and I really kind of wanted to to get a sense from you of, like, what you think this team's ceiling is. You know, you look at Ken Palm right now, it's, they've got him 30th, which feels – Maybe a little bit low, but the offense is a top 25 offense in the country, according again, according to Ken Palm defense, a little bit lower there, 64th, still not bad by any stretch of the imagination. But I'm curious if you think that there are some things that, that may potentially hold this team back, or, or I guess more importantly, what, what you think this team's ceiling really is. Uh, we're still a long ways away from March, obviously. A lot of things could change, but looking at them right now and kind of where they're expected to be in the tournament and, and kind of you know, what we've seen of the, the strengths and weaknesses for this team, kind of where you think they might end up. Well, if you can beat a team like UConn, I think your mm-hmm. ceiling has to be pretty high sure. this year. Uh, and they didn't just beat them. They won that game by 12 points. They really controlled that game, especially in the second half. And they did so with starting point guard Jared Bynum out with an mm-hmm. abdominal injury. So right. you put that all together. And I think, um, I, don't know, I don't know if we should expect another Sweet 16 run, but that is certainly uh, within the realm of possibilities for this team. I think they can go deeper. I mean, mm-hmm. UConn's going to be a top four seed. And yeah. when you get into that second, third round of the tournaments, when you play those teams, the Friars have shown they can play with and beat a team of that caliber. Mm-hmm. So I think that is where you'd like to see the Friars end up with the talent that they have. Now, the weaknesses, it's really kind of along the three-point line right now. Yeah. They don't shoot the three ball a lot. They aren't the best three-point shooting team, although they have gotten better here as the season's gone along. Bryce Hopkins has gotten better from the outside. Devin Carter's gotten better from the outside. Noah Locke has finally started to hit the shots we all know he can hit. He's been a very good three-point shooter in his now very long uh, college (laughs) basketball career. Um, And Jared Bynum, whenever he does return, he's a guy who can hit those shots. So three-point shooting is something they can do. I think it's consistency, which becomes the question mark. Three-point defense, on the other hand, I think is kind of a question mark. And it's the broader theme of communication on defense. That's where this team has had issues there. That's why uh, UConn plays a a slower offense, and they were able to really slow UConn down and hold them to 61 points. Mm -hmm. The following game, St. John's comes in and scores 80. 
Why? The Red Storm play faster. And right. yeah, that's more possessions, but it's also they force you into miscommunications. They force you into worst positions because of the way they like to play. And mm-hmm. um, that's where uh, this is a Friars team that potentially in the tournament could get, also get upset in the first mm-hmm. round if you face a team that knows how to exploit that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to talk about Ed Cooley here before we move on to the next segment, Matt. Uh, obviously, a coach who has a lot of pedigree. He's been around for he's been at least at least 10 years at Providence, if not more than that. He was obviously at Fairfield before that. A lot of NCAA tournament appearances, Big East coach of the year last year. Uh, now, obviously, with some already some early season coaching turmoil around the league, certainly Texas is looking for a new coach. There's a lot of rumblings about what's happening at Kentucky. We'll talk a little bit more about Georgetown later in the show, but uh, it seems like Ed Cooley's name always comes up. Uh, and that's a sign of respect. That's a sign of, of obviously, you know, respecting what he has been able to do. Uh, won the Big East tournament last year, obviously four seed in the NCAA tournament, looking like a really solid coach, uh, really solid team right now. Uh, this season, I'm curious kind of when you look at it's really hard to evaluate coaches because like, yeah, Bill Self is a fantastic coach. Scott Drew is a fantastic coach, but they're also at programs that have a bit more resources. Uh, certainly Kansas, a lot more pedigree going back, you know, decades and decades. Um, so when you're evaluating a coach like Ed Cooley at Providence, I'm curious kind of how you think his performance stacks up to even some of the best coaches uh, in the game uh, in the last couple of years and maybe even kind of in his career overall. I think the first thing you have to take away from what Ed Cooley has done at Providence is to put it, you have to put it in the context of who the Providence Friars are as a program. This is a program historically that uh, has not gone to the NCAA tournament every single year. They've kind of been a stopover destination for coaches. You see Rick Pitino comes in, leads them, and then he's off. And Rick Barnes and Pete Gillen and all guys who came in and then left. Uh, This is the first coach who's come in and transformed the program. He's mm-hmm. bought in and turned Providence around. They got that a shiny new building on campus for all the recruits in the basketball right. center there. And um, mm-hmm. so that right there, just bringing in money, that changes mm-hmm. a lot. And then you combine that with uh, he's brought in recruits. He's turned Providence into one of the better destinations in the Big East from a job that was not considered the best one. And now right. really the last most of the last two and a half, three seasons here, the Friars have been one of the best teams in college basketball. If you, if you take out the COVID season, because mm-hmm. that, that was a different one right. from the midpoint of that 2019-2020 season when the Friars turned things around to today, this has been one of the best teams in college basketball. And yeah. this year, they're looking to do something the program has not done since 72-73, which is to win an NCAA tournament game in back-to-back years. It's mm-hmm. been that long. And um, yeah, this Ed Cooley has to be one of the best coaches in all of college basketball right now. And Um, he's the guy right now who's the leader of the Big East uh, Mm -hmm. with Jay Wright retired. Yeah, absolutely. Providence isn't the only hot team in the Big East. There's five teams now expected to go dancing this year, according to Joe Lenardi's recent bracketology. We're going to talk about whether a sixth team could sneak into the Big Dance. But before we do that, today's episode of Locked On College Basketball is brought to you by Bet Online. College basketball and the NBA are back in action, and the NFL playoffs are fast approaching. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all of your betting needs and sports information. From all the latest odds, contests, and player props, you name it. BetOnline remains the best spot for all the latest sports developments, including podcasts and reviews for all the leagues this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sports wagering information needs, including live betting and your favorite Vegas casino games. They even have lines for coaching changes across every major sport, so even in the offseason, you can get your fix. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. Bet online, where the game starts. All right, segment two, still any patents, still Locked On College Basketball. And I want to sincerely thank all of you for making Locked On College Basketball your first listen of the day. For your second listen today, check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast. From the games that matter the most to the biggest stories in sports, go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insights that only Locked On can provide. Locked On Sports Today, available on this app, YouTube, and wherever you get podcasts. All right, Matt, we're talking bracketology here. I know it's mid-January, barely even mid-January, so we still got a lot of time before the field is determined. Uh, But we've already seen the Big East kind of 
go through a lot of ebbs and flows this season. Obviously, Villanova was expected to be better. Creighton was expected to be better. There was some optimism that a couple other teams might be more in the conversation for an NCAA tournament bid. And then now, of course, we've seen teams like Xavier, teams like Marquette really step up in a major way. So what I want to do here, Matt, is I want to read to you the latest seed predictions from Joe Lenardi for each of the five teams that are expected to make the big dance out of the Big East, and then kind of just discuss whether we think that that seed is going to go up or down based on how that team's been playing lately and maybe what the rest of their schedule looks like. So UConn right now is projected on the two line. Of course, they were originally projected on the one line or recently projected on the one line have moved down a little bit there. Xavier is now all the way up to a projected three seed for Sean Miller's Musketeers. Uh, Marquette is a four seed right now. Providence, a five seed, and then Creighton all the way down at an eight seed. So I'm kind of curious if, uh, what your thoughts are on those seed projections right now and maybe how you think that might end up come March. Well, I want to start at the bottom there with yeah. Creighton because I think this is a Creighton team that ends up moving up quite yeah. a bit from number eight. Um, I think the preseason projections on Creighton were wrong. Mm -hmm. in them being a top five team, but this is still a really good team. Yeah. Basically all of the losses they have this year are fully explainable by injury illness or playing on the road at a very, very, very good team, a team that's okay. going to probably be a top four seed right. uh, in, in a couple months here. Mm -hmm. So if Creighton wins the home games, like the blue Jays should yeah, and picks up and doesn't have any bad losses here, they're going to have a really, really good record in the Big East. They're going to be one of the top five teams in the Big East. They're going to have mm -hmm. players. I don't know if they're going to have a first team guy. Although I, we'll see what Kalkbrenner ends up doing. Yeah. But they'll have, probably have a first or second team guy there in Kalkbrenner and a couple other guys that'll get mentions or second mm -hmm. team. And mm -hmm. this is going to be a team that'll end up with a good record and get hot and people are going to forget about the losing streak that they had. Yeah. I think Creighton should end up as a six seed or higher if mm -hmm. they play the way they should. The rest of these teams should probably end up around where they are right now, and it's gonna it's gonna come down to the nitty gritty of what they do. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a clear top five and bottom six in the Big mm -hmm. East right now, and these teams can stay clean below the bottom six, win the home games, be the teams they're supposed to beat: DePaul, beat Georgetown, beat mm -hmm. Butler, St. John's, Seton Hall. Those are probably the ones you're really looking at right now. If you do that, all these teams are going to be above 500 in conference play. Mm -hmm. and with a couple of big wins on the resume, protect the home court, and they should all be top five seeds. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you on that 100%. I think there's really kind of a, a cut in the Big East of five on this side, six on this side. But I kind of want to discuss if you think that there's a possibility for that to change. And there's one notable team that I think most people would be surprised, uh, especially people who are tuning in right now after the conclusion of the college football season. Uh, welcome to the college basketball season. Uh, and, and I think a lot of people would be like, well, where's Villanova? Like, why are they not a part of this conversation? You and I have talked multiple times on this podcast, and certainly people uh, who Who've been plugged into college basketball have been well aware of what has been going on with Villanova, obviously a new coach, uh, serious injuries with Justin Moore being out with Cam Whitmore missing quite a few games uh, early in the season. But I'm kind of curious your thoughts on now that they are, you know, the season's starting to settle a little bit. They've gotten Whitmore back uh, kind of if you think that this team has the horses, has the potential to make a late season push and potentially put themselves in that conversation. I don't know if an at-large bid is something that is is particularly realistic for them, although I think it's it's plausible, it's at least possible. Uh, but it also seems possible that this team could at least put the horses together to make a, a, a really big run in the Big East tournament. Is that something you see as a, as a possibility for Villanova? Or do you think that uh, it's it's kind of already time to turn the page and, and look towards next year for the for the Wildcats? It's not time to turn the page just yet, but the number that's worrying here is that big zero in the win column for mm -hmm. Quadrant 1 right now. Yeah. They're 0-5 in Quad 1, and they just lost two home games recently to Marquette and Villanova in their own building. Mm -hmm. And these are, for when you look at the grand scheme of things for Villanova, those are games you can't really afford to lose. Mm -hmm. Now you need it to be nearly perfect from here on out for the Wildcats yeah. to have a shot at an at-large bid. and. I, I think they have the horses to be a tournament caliber team come March. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they have the horses to make up the ground on the resume right. that they're going to need to make up. And uh, this is a team. Yeah. Cam Whitmore came back. Justin Moore still not back. Jordan mm -hmm. Longino was just announced uh, today when we were recording this literally yeah. minutes before us recording this, right. that he is going to be out for a minimum of two weeks here with a mm -hmm. uh, leg injury and, the the backcourt is just not good. Angelo Brizzy, who is supposed to be part of this backcourt, has now transferred. Mm -hmm. There's 
there's nothing in this backcourt right now outside of Caleb Daniels, who's a mm-hmm. first team Big East caliber player. But whoever the I mean, Chris Archdiakono is not getting it done there. Right. The defense is the worst it's been since 2012, and Villanova didn't make the dance then. So mm-hmm. don't rule out Villanova just yet. But it's going to take a serious improvement in a very short amount of time here. And we're recording this before they go play at DePaul. They're yeah. not favored over by. Or they're not favored over DePaul as much as they usually would be. If yeah. they don't come out of there with a win, and you're listening to this tomorrow morning, mm-hmm. uh, if they lose to DePaul tonight, then mm-hmm. yeah, I think you can just about say it's done for Villanova without a Big East tournament win. So, so let's. I mean, if if we're assuming that Villanova's chances of making the NCAA tournament are at least slim at this point, then I think the big thing for for Wildcats fans or at least Big East fans to really be kind of watching for down the stretch is like, what can we see some improvements from? The, from Kyle Neptune. Can we see some adjustments? Can we see some changes? You know, a, a relatively unproven guy, obviously, was Jay Wright's right-hand man for a really long time. Uh, took that job at Fordham, went 500 at Fordham, is now exactly 500. As we're recording this, as you're listening to this, uh, he is either one game above or one game below 500. Hopefully, uh, for Wildcats fans, he is one game above 500. But uh, I'm curious your thoughts on his performance so far. Obviously, he has been dealt a pretty raw hand in terms of the significant injuries that Villanova has suffered and is continuing to suffer, as you mentioned. But um, is there anything he can do to really kind of help ease some of the concerns that fans might have about, you know, losing a Hall of Fame coach to retirement and then having a disappointing season the next year? I think the big thing would be to get a freshman guard, Mark Armstrong, involved and yeah. get him going. He was very highly recruited. Cam Whitmore drew the praise, but Mark Armstrong was a guy who was, who was right up there in the recruiting rankings, and he has looked very inconsistent this year. We've seen glimpses of what he can be. Right. Getting more out of him consistently. Uh, he's not a guy that's leaving for the NBA yet, mm-hmm. so we're going to have him next year at, at a minimum, and that kind of becomes your big building piece right. here for the future. I think you like the, there's a lot of talent down the the depth of this team that is not getting used. I don't think all of that is on Kyle Neptune here, though. I think some of this is guys who just they've been there for a couple of years and they're not they haven't developed. So, um, yeah, and it's I think you want to see the defense improve here. Mm-hmm. I do think some of this isn't on Kyle Neptune. Some of this is on these are just the guys that they have, and with that many injuries, they don't have the depth to account for it. Um, yeah, and it's. I don't know how much this is on Kyle Neptune. It's it's the hard part right now. Well, we talked a lot about uh, the, the really strong performance of Ed Cooley and the Providence Friars, and I really kind of want to transition a little bit to talk about a couple other coaches who are new-ish to the Big East and kind of the performances that they have had recently and kind of also uh, preview the upcoming games. A Thursday night, we have two fantastic games going on in the Big East, Creighton Xavier, UConn Marquette. Uh, and the coaches I really want to talk about here are the jobs that we've seen from Shaka Smart this year uh, with Marquette, of course, and Sean Miller. Uh, at Xavier, obviously, Sean Miller went through a lot uh, with his transition out of Arizona and and everything that went on there. Shaka Smart leaving Texas to come to Marquette, two guys at really marquee prominent programs who have moved to the Big East uh, and, and have had a ton of success. So I would love to hear kind of your impressions on how those two coaches have done so far and also talk about these two really exciting basketball games coming up tonight. Yeah, tonight, Wednesday night, that's that's a pair of them, both at 7, by the way, one on FS1, one one on CBS Sports, so you're either going to have to wear out that swap button on your remote or get the dual screen set set up for this one. There you go. But, um, yeah, Shaka Smart's done an incredible job here. Mm -hmm. This is a team that was, for the second year in a a row, projected to finish ninth in the Big East, and for the second year in a row is not going to come close to doing that. Uh, This is a team that plays, it's, it's a very connected team. I think that's probably the best best phrase to use for it and he gets a lot of contributions out of everybody up and down the lineup they play with depth he doesn't pick the high recruits he picks the guys to fit his system buy into what he wants to do and then he's going to make your life miserable Mm -hmm. this defense actually is not ranked all that highly in efficiency but i also think that kind of misses the point it's very good at forcing turnovers and that leads to easy offense and those easy buckets will outweigh some of the bad defensive possessions that you get as a result of the over aggressiveness. And it's worked so far this year. They, they have not lost that. They don't have a bad loss on the resume here. Uh, but it's just uh, this game tonight against UConn is a huge test because yeah. UConn is one of these teams are going to play that really is just more talented across the board yeah. and has depth and has size mm-hmm. and how these, it's two different styles. How they go against each other will be very telling for, I mean, Shaka Smart and Dan Hurley are two guys who could be in this national coach of the year conversation at this mm-hmm. point for what they've done. And then it becomes a big test of how they can adjust against one another. 
I, well, for me too, like, like, you know, people would, ob would obviously put Scott Drew in that conversation, not this season necessarily, but in years past, he's been in that conversation and it sure seemed like Shaka outcoached the heck out of him in that game uh, that they played earlier in the year. So, I mean, Shaka Smart is just about out coaching everybody that he has played this year. What an incredible run that they have had. And, and I really kind of want to talk a little bit too about uh, what we've seen from Sean Miller. I, I, I watched Xavier a handful of times this year. Uh, they came very close to beating Gonzaga in the Phil Knight Invitational. They've put together some really nice wins, uh, really utilizing their big men well. It seems like a, a really dangerous team uh, as they kind of have continued to put the pieces together and figure out what they have uh, for the Musketeers. Yeah, it shouldn't be a surprise that this offense is as good as it is, especially with mm -hmm. Sean Miller as a head coach. Yeah. That's his specialty. And Zach Fremantle is a guy who was banged up last year. He looks mm -hmm. fully back in shape now, and he's yeah. an impact player. He's a first-team all-conference caliber guy. Sule Boom was a shooter. We always knew he could score. Mm -hmm. The fact that Xavier can score should not be a surprise. Right. What is interesting is this was one of the worst paint defenses in the <laughs> Big East last season. Yeah. They returned all the same guys with a new coach, and mm – -hmm. Now it's one of the, the better paint defenses out there. Three-point defense is still an issue for them. But they've they've improved yeah. across the board with mostly the same guys. And yeah. that's the Sean Miller effect right there. He got guys to buy in. Um, and there I think there were some interesting interviews with him over the mm -hmm. summer and talking about the role Colby Jones was going to have. Colby Jones is one of the few guys in all of college basketball that can give you over – over 10 points, over five rebounds, over five assists, all in the same game. He does everything. And yeah, the, the communication on offense, the cohesiveness on offense to set up these looks is incredibly impressive. That's it's a shame that I mean, Sean Miller is not going to get any coach of the year nods here because mm -hmm. of the other stuff that's going on in the Big East. Right. Sean Miller might not might be the fourth or fifth best coach in the Big East right now. Mm -hmm. And he also might be a top 15 coach in the country, depending on who you ask. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely ridiculous performance by the, the coaches in the Big East. I was kind of so as I was putting the notes together, I was like, man, I feel like we could talk about the incredible coaching performances for so many different coaches in the conference. Uh, but I kind of want to move away from that and talk about yeah. maybe some of the teams that haven't quite met their expectations. Uh, again, we are recording this on Tuesday before a handful of Big East games. Uh, St. John's and Butler is one of them. And those are two teams that I kind of wanted to talk about uh, right now. So obviously comparing them head to head before they play their game may be a little bit silly but as we're as we're talking right now St. John's on a five game losing streak they have been they started the year 8-0 and they are 3 and 6 since then they got blown out by Seton Hall their only conference win again as we're recording this is against DePaul uh what the heck is going on with the Red Storm right now they have a very soft non-conference schedule and mm -hmm. the win the win total does not tell the whole truth with sure. this team yeah. They don't have a road win this year. The closest they have is a neutral site win in Florida against Florida State. Mm -hmm. That's a really bad Florida State team. Yeah, that's not a great year. win. <laughs> no, it's just I, I, St. John's was a team that got a lot of hype mm -hmm. over the summer, and I mm -hmm. never really saw it because they lost Julian Champagny, and they yeah. lost all of their shooting. And yeah. they replaced it with David Jones, who's a very good player, but not as good as Champagny, and Andre mm -hmm. Curbelo, another guard who is not a very good shooter. Yeah, This team is very, very good at specific things, which mm -hmm. means when they play bad teams, they can run a, run them out of a building because right. they can force turnovers and take advantage of stuff and, and really, really make life miserable. Yeah. But the problem is as soon as you go against a team that isn't going to turn the ball over, mm -hmm. everything stops. Everything yeah. dries up. They had a lead on Providence at halftime. They had a lead on Villanova at halftime. Both mm -hmm. of those were on the road. They played with Xavier at home. They've played with good teams here, mm -hmm. but they, they are clearly... Uh, those, those are their best performances this mm -hmm. year. Yeah. And they're clearly kind of a, a player short here. Uh, Butler is kind of the same category. This team has a win over Kansas State. I will say we talked about teams that can get into the tournament. Butler and Seton Hall both have quad one wins here. Yeah, they can play with the big boys, but Butler's super inconsistent shooting the ball. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what this backcourt is. So if they're if their guys aren't on in a given night, they have no shot. If their shooters are there and they're actually hitting the shots, they can compete with anybody in the Big East. It's just been a lot more of the former than the latter there, and that's why the mm -hmm. record looks like what it does. That's why they've struggled in Big East play, and that's why they've struggled on the road too. You know, their shooting has not traveled whatsoever this yeah. year. And um, if I have to make a prediction on what happens tonight, mm -hmm. um, predict I'm assuming a St. John's victory here, yeah. which I don't think changes anything about how I feel about these teams at this point. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I want to talk about Seton Hall as well. Shaheen Holloway, obviously another fun coach to be added to the Big East, and they're already very fun coaching carousel that they have uh, in that conference. We've seen this team kind of have some some really nice performances. Uh, they laid an absolute smackdown on Butler in their recent game. They laid a smackdown on St. John's. Um, they have a win over Memphis, which is a really nice victory, but other than that, uh, we've seen some inconsistency from them as well. They got uh, beat pretty badly by Marquette. Very close game against Xavier, which is nice. Really bad be- uh, loss to Creighton. So they've just kind of been a little all over the place. Of course, we know they dealt with some early season injuries. Uh, we also know that Shaheen is a very good defensive coach on the offensive side of things. <laughs> hasn't quite come together. Uh, they're playing Georgetown tonight as we're recording this. I am expecting a victory there. Although, of course, uh, if Georgetown does pull off the victory, perhaps that changes uh, the last couple of conversations we're going to have here but I'm curious what you've thought of Holloway and the job that he's done with the Pirates so far I I think the most frustrating thing about the Seton Hall team has been Mm -hmm. kind of the defense which you wouldn't expect but anybody who looked at this roster coming into the year knew the offense was gonna really have to piece things together Uh there was a lot of you weren't sure where that was going to come from Mm -hmm. but it's a long team a veteran team you expect they'll be able to win games with defense they have one of those wins this year, which was the game against Rutgers where right. they win 45-43. Yeah. When they have faced top offenses this year, they gave up 73 points at Xavier, which isn't terrible, but 83 points against Creighton, 83 points against Marquette, 83 points against Iowa, and 91 at Kansas. Yeah. And that's just – if you're supposed to win with defense, that mm-hmm. is not going to get it done. They also yeah. only have one true road win this year, which was at Rutgers 45-43. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's – Seton Hall can compete. I, I expect they probably get one of these wins at home against the top team because mm-hmm. they're able to make it dirty and disrupt yeah. an offense and they'll get, they'll get one win in there. Mm-hmm. I, that's not going to be enough. I don't think. And I don't, I don't think they're a good enough team to escape getting a bad loss. That yeah. worries me about this game at Georgetown. Mm-hmm. That shooting is so inconsistent. It's a Georgetown offense. that's actually been good Yeah. Uh, from a matchup perspective. This is actually one Georgetown can win mm-hmm. with a good game. I don't expect they will, but Seton Hall, any, any team that loses to Georgetown this year in the Big East, mm-hmm. if you, that's probably the, the death knell on your at-large hopes if you aren't one of the top five already. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, let's talk about Georgetown. Uh, again, we're talking before this game, so perhaps the streak will be over. Uh, I do think that amongst the, the matchups that are left for Patrick Ewing's team, this is a more winnable one for them, and maybe they'll maybe they'll get off the schneid and end this, this streak. But whether they do or not, I, I mean, it's past time to have a very serious conversation about Patrick Ewing. Look, I, we know that he is an icon. He is a legacy. He is, in many ways, the Big East, or at least the old iteration of the Big East was defined by what Patrick Ewing did at Georgetown as a player. But he's a bad basketball coach. I don't think there's any other possible way to look at what has happened with this team. I saw a tweet. I think it was actually a tweet by uh, Road to the Garden uh, that talked about like how many games they were up five up 10 tied at half up 15 at half and they lost badly in the second half i remember distinctly they were up 10 against lmu and got beat by 18 like this team that that stuff to me shows an inability to make adjustments as a coach and it's been like this for the entire time that he has been the head coach at georgetown uh it's it's got to be time to make a change right uh we're past the time i think (laughs) just about every Everybody was shocked when he came back for this year, but mm-hmm. you could at least make the argument for this year. This is a team that had gone through a lot of um, a lot of a lot of talent had left the program, mm-hmm. and a significant amount of that was not Patrick Ewing's fault. So the idea was, all right, we're going to keep him for one more year. Well, they had a top freshman last year, Amina Muhammad. He doesn't come back. They mm-hmm. had a top guard, Dante Harris. We found out right before the season that he wasn't with the program anymore. And he has since transferred to Virginia. Yep. So that was kind of the one selling point. And if talent won't stick around, mm-hmm. I don't know what the point is here because right. Georgetown has young talent. They got two of the top 10 scores in the big East right now. And both of them are sophomores. These mm-hmm. are guys they can bring back and build with, but the defense is abysmal. You talked about the trend about them blowing leads mm-hmm. that happened last game, mm-hmm. Georgetown, Without Brandon Murray, who's one of those scorers, yeah. led by two points at Marquette at halftime and then gave up 61 second half points. They, the game was not close. It just it turned immediately. And yeah. um, it's it's a shame because mm-hmm. Georgetown actually has talent. This Georgetown team should be bad, but not this bad. It should be top 100 in Ken Palm, mm-hmm. six or seven wins in the Big East, yeah. playing with teams, giving them issues bad. 
mm-hmm. and hopefully maybe can maybe doing something in like the NIT if you get a bid. Right. That's what we're talking about for the talent level on this Georgetown team. And it's not it's not going over in the Big East, which is absolutely on the table. And yeah. you're looking at maybe an upper ceiling of two wins in the Big East with how they've been playing. It's just mm-hmm. th- there has to be change. Well, Matt, that's as good a time as any to to close the door on another fantastic Big East conversation. I always appreciate your insight. I appreciate you taking the time to come on the show today. Uh, of course. Uh, I want to sneak. Can I sneak in one last note Absolutely. here? Absolutely. <laughs> the one coach we didn't mention in the coaching conversation is Greg McDermott, who yeah. uh, Creighton plays at Xavier tonight at seven. And that's mm-hmm. um, this is a, a Creighton team that was supposed to, again, be top five, was supposed to be really good. McDermott mm-hmm. is also a guy who's at least a top 25 coach nationally, I think. Yeah. And you look at those five coaches we talked about in the Big East. And with Jay Wright not there, it looks like the future of the conference is safe in the hands of those five, assuming they stick around. Well, Matt, let's uh, let's let's pick a time and uh, maybe next week, maybe later in the season, uh, whenever we get a chance to do a, a big East coaches draft, because I thought about changing our notes and doing that today, but I didn't have time. But I think that would be a really fun exercise to look at the uh, the range of coaches in this conference and have a conversation about them. I can tell you already who the last pick would be. We don't have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Me too. All right. That's going to do it for us today. Uh, check out the show wherever you get podcasts. Uh, if you have not done so yet, go subscribe on our YouTube channel. Uh, more fun stuff coming your way coming your way later this week for now peace out <laughs>